Yeah, happy now. Yeah, that should be it. And, and John, you should be. And John, yeah, there you go. That should be good. Testing. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds great. this, but you're on my calendar tomorrow. I'll be in early tomorrow. Well, I have a, an appointment at 8.30, but I'll be in in the morning. Okay. So. Well, I've got an uh, interview in the first thing in the morning, then I'm going over to uh, uh, Caffeinery to touch base with uh, Pete Ellery at 10, and I've got lunch with you, and then I'll be in the department okay. all afternoon. Great, great, great. Good to see you, buddy. It's time, John. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm January 17, of the college. If you haven't met me, welcome to uh, our first lecture of the year, actually. This wasn't on our original schedule, but we had a great opportunity. John Motlock uh, is helping us launch our new Certificate in Sustainability, which is very innovative in its format and will reach across the nation. And we needed him here on campus, and it seemed an opportune time to have him speak with us as well. Um, many of you know John, but uh, here's a brief background. He had uh, taught at the university here in the Department of Landscape Architecture for 21 years. He's now Professor Emeritus, lives on the East Coast in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, he's currently listed on the Fulbright Specialist roster uh, that matches specialists with projects designed by host institutions in 150 plus countries. He just completed a Fulbright in Morocco where he worked with the International School of Architecture, Urbanism, and Design on the school's new Master of Resilience, Sustainable, and Smart Buildings and Cities degree program and became one of its first uh, speakers and keynotes. Uh, he consults with Thriving Community Solutions that helps communities find innovative strategies that build stronger regional networks, more regenerative communities, and ability to thrive locally. He also consults with Sustainable Communities Institute, Inc., which is based here in Muncie, to help threaten communities across the country in rapidly changing socioeconomic systems, enhance their self-reliance. Uh, this fall, as I mentioned, he's going to be launching, helping us launch, literally on, on his shoulders, we'll launch the, uh, the first phase of our sustainability certificate. He'll be teaching uh, in our five-week sequence, so we're, every five weeks we'll have another series of one-hour courses, we call them stackable credits, that will accrue towards a certificate of sustainability that becomes an expert credential. Uh, that's available for our students on campus as well as the people across the country uh, in, in practice. Uh, he uh, is going to be teaching this, this fall on environmental ethics, a component there, uh, also in business eth ethics and the environment, as well as social and environmental justice. Uh, if you were around when John was here, you know that he was known for his excellence in pushing the boundaries of sustainability, thinking holistically, engaging uh, the educational process and thinking differently about education in terms of how we reach communities and how we work together to create uh, more sustainable environments for all of us. Uh, so many of us admire him greatly and I'm delighted that his post retirement uh, career seems to be as robust as it was here. He's very, very involved around the world, and we're fortunate to have him with us tonight. So welcome, John. Thank you, Dave. Well, I want to begin by uh, thanking uh, Dave and uh, Bob Kester for bringing me in, for uh, getting uh, me getting involved in the uh, uh, Graduate Certificate in Sustainability and for the opportunity to come back and uh, spend uh, two or three days here in, uh, in Muncie. I'll be here on campus in the building uh, tomorrow afternoon, so I'll get the opportunity, have the opportunity to see uh, many of you. I'm here today to talk about trends that I see emerging in higher education talking about a three-part presentation. The first part will be talking about uh, sustainability leadership at this critical time in history. And we'll, I'll talk about 
uh, what's so crucial about this particular time in, uh, in history. It really is a one-time event uh, in, in human history, certainly. Uh, and so I'll start by talking about sustainability leadership in this unique time. Then I'll talk a bit about the history of sustainability leadership on Ball State campus. And then I'll close with some notions about what I see as trends occurring in higher education today. And as Dave said, I, uh, I like to push the edges. And in being asked to talk a bit about trends, I do that. I give you a, a caveat, disclaimer, right now in the sense that when I talk about trends, some of those will be trends that I see actually happening on campuses today. Some of them will be trends that need to happen and I'm having discussions with some universities, uh, key universities who are wanting to uh, transform to that next level. And then the third level of trends that really have to be trends and I'm not even yet having those discussions. So they're looking at trends, not only looking back at trends that are already occurring, but looking forward also to the key trends that have to occur if we're going to negotiate this unique period of history, which is, I think, the next decade. We've got the next decade to, uh, to make uh, grand transitions. You know, in terms of leadership and sustainability, a couple of weeks ago, I was introduced through some uh, people I uh, uh, collaborate with to uh, one of the newest TED Talks. And I love to use TED Talks in, my, uh, in the courses I teach. This TED Talk is a 15-minute TED Talk by a guy, a guy named uh, George uh, Monbiot. Monbiot. And it was delivered, I think, in July of this year. So it's only a couple of months ago. So I encourage you to, uh, to review that video. It's quite entertaining. I enjoyed watching it. I think uh, you will. Um, the, um, in that video, it's really all about story. It's about story as being the way that we give meaning to the world around us as we experience it. And if it's a good story, then it produces good solutions. If it's not a particularly good story, it doesn't produce very good solutions. And the only way to shift stories is to create a new story. I mean, you can't have somebody just forget your story of how the world works unless you give them a more compelling story. And so that's what we'll be talking a lot about today is stories and the story of um, sustainability at this unique time in history. So in his, uh, in his uh, TED talk, George looks at the last 80 years and looks at it as a um, cycle of a couple of stories. Now, in the stories that he talks about, that he focuses on, it's actually called um, the restoration story. It's a story for restoring the world. And a lot of people, if you look at where the world is today, there's a lot of people saying restoration is really needed. And in this restoration story, uh, as in each of these stories, there's kind of an underlying narrative. And in the restoration story, the basic narrative that underlies the story is that nefarious forces have taken over the world and they've created chaos and chaos reigns. Uh, the other half of that story is a hero will emerge and the hero will recapture the world and reestablish order. And so 
Uh, that's the restoration story. And he looks at, uh, at the end of the Depression, laissez-faire economics had really put us into the Depression. That was the villain. And the new hero was the working class who would redistribute wealth. And that over a period of several decades, uh, the heroes became the villains in the sense that then there became a perception that collectivizing was really the problem that was creating disorder and what we needed was a new hero, the entrepreneurs who could lead us into further, uh, further development, restoring order and, uh, and harmony. And then out of that eventually, that, oops, That led to the entrepreneur becoming the new villain. The extreme individualism we have that uh, individuals succeeding at the cost of society is the, is the problem. And his new hero didn't exist. There wasn't a new compelling story which is where his, his video then goes into talking about what might be the foundations of the next new story. I'd like to leave that story at this point and talk about a little bit about a book that I read about a year ago called Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus. Has anybody read that book? It's a fascinating book interesting title by a guy named Douglas Rushkoff. He also has a lot of uh, videos online you can look at that basically <coughs> tell the story. But instead of looking at an 80-year framework, his story, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, basically goes back 800 years and starts basically at the uh, Middle Ages where you had local commerce beginning to build a middle class. And that the king, as it got to build to be a, a threat to the king, then he chartered certain companies, and that then gave power to those companies that then would kick back to the king, and then that chartered companies grew into chartered corporations, do, grew into digital corporations, to where now, you know, when I click on the internet, I'm bombarded with some digital corporation trying to con me into buying something that I really don't need. So, um, Rushkoff looks at the last 800 years as a series of these waves. And I did a, um, I led a uh, conference on campus uh, back in 2016 looking at the uh, new economy that hopefully could, uh, the next economy that could uh, take uh, Muncie into its next uh, generation of development. And I talked about each of those waves as having an emergence, having a growth, having a maturation, and then going into decline. So there are these bell curves that basically, when there was a need, that need grew, and through the growth, it actually became the problem that created the need for the next emergence. So this is a typical pattern of what happens whenever you're engaging a system in an unsustainable manner. You boom and you bust. You grow beyond capacity and you cease to be able to be sustainable. So that I combined, started thinking about those two books and, or that video and the book, and the real issue that began to come very clear to me is that whether I looked at 80 years or whether I looked at 800 years, I was looking at a pattern of, of a new restoration story that was somehow playing itself out in a deeper story that really didn't work. 
And that deeper story, if I remember at the end of the Middle Ages when you had local uh, villages beginning to build their local systems, it began to be corrupted by an external force extracting the wealth that was being produced. And so we've been for 800 years in what I call a meta story of externalizing the impacts of decisions we make so that we can continue to take more out of the system to the detriment of someone else. And so there was a book back in the mid 80s, The Turning Point by Frito Capra, and The Turning Point talked about the world was at a turning point. That was 35 years ago, and that has slowly, I think, been taking hold to where now there's a fairly broad recognition that we are at a turning point and that something has to change and that we've now been given a window of about 10 years by 2030 and the 2030 challenge came out in, in architecture about oh, 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, that was dealing with how do we deal with that window between 2010 and 2030 and one way we dealt with it, as we'll see in a second, that our ecological footprint, our impact on our assault on ecological systems has actually accelerated rather than beginning to address what we need to address in that 20 year period. So it really is time for a new story, but it's not just a new story, it's a new meta story. Now in his video, George talks about uh, the strange things that's happening right now where people in various sciences are all beginning to come to the realization that there's somehow kind of deep interconnectivity going on <clears throat> that we didn't really know about. Just like in landscape architecture five or six years ago, we began talking about this thing of crosstalks, of plant com plants communicating with other plants so that somehow or other things, uh, plants don't behave independently of everything around them, but rather there's this network conversation that's going on that we don't really understand. So about this time I was looking a lot at what, what's now being called complexity science. Science but not reductive science, not science that isolates an issue and deals only with that, but the science that deals with the interconnectivity of everything. <clears throat> scientists talk about messy problems, problems that happen in the world, real world, because they don't have easy solutions. They don't have right and wrongs. They're all about this dynamic set of complexity and messiness. We work our way through that by finding as, as uh, rich and robust kinds of solutions uh, that we can. So I started looking at Complexity science also started looking at this thing called big history. Because big history, in some ways, for me at least, gives some of that insight into that meta story. Because instead of looking at 80 years or 800 years, it looks at 14 billion years. And it looks at the basic nature of <coughs> what, comfortably speaking, is called regenerative systems. And in complexity science, it tends to be called complex adaptive systems. But these are systems where all of the different things in those systems somehow adapt with each other so that the system as a complex system is able to regenerate itself. And so Big History looks at, and there's a neat video, uh, TED Talk, 18 minutes, History of the World by a guy named David Christian. And uh, in, uh, in big history, it speaks about there being a couple of what I would say are transformations in the ability of complex systems to become more complex. And the first generation or the first transformation was when we went from a cosmic soup to when we went to physical interconnectivity of everything, planets, the building of planets, galaxies, uh, solar systems, spiraling galaxies, that 
were the, that transformed the cosmic soup into light, into mass, into materials, into consolidations that then became first generation, second generation planets. Out of that, then the complexity continued. And then on planet Earth, the next really big change, which was the Earth becoming an ecologically complex system. And this is where I think the role of you as designers really comes to the table. Because what each of us inherited when we were born, the system we inherited was an ecologically complex system. Now what do I mean by ecologically complex? It's a system where all of the different things that operate in that system are interconnected with a complexity that allows an ecological system to take photons of light, of sunlight, and use those photons of sunlight to transform a gray planet flying through space into the ecological richness and diversity and productivity of planet Earth. That's complex. And when you recognize the real complexity of the system, we realize that the system is more complex than we think, than we can think. We can't think as complex as the system works, because as we think more complex, we engage in that system and make it more complex. So we're in the process of co-designing a more complex system, and so we're constantly creating the future while we're trying to catch up with the future. And that's kind of the role of design. Now, unfortunately, uh, so this is a slide where it's talking about how sunlight comes in and how living systems use the energy from that sunlight to create <coughs> the diversity on the, on the face of the earth today. Now, <coughs> big history also talks about <coughs> the fact that in this unique period in history, we're in a crucial time in the emergence of a whole new level of complexity. And that's conscious complexity. When humanity becomes smart enough to consciously engage in complex systems for the benefit of that complex system rather than how much can we take away from it so that we can do whatever it is we want to do. So when humanity becomes sophisticated enough to engage with complex systems in a way that helps them regenerate rather than causes them to become degenerating, uh, we will basically trigger the completion of that, uh, the maturation of that third uh, complexity. That's a meta story. And that's a meta story is the one that I believe we're living in. And if we get smart enough to collaborate, to partner with complexity, it'll be the mother of all economies, as a friend of mine in Austin loves to say. Uh, if we're producing what we are now in a planet that we're dragging down, think of what we can produce in a planet where we're collaborating in creating more potential. Now, in terms of complex adaptive systems, which for comfort I'll refer to as regenerative systems, they operate through an immense number of cycles of innovation, and of co-adaption. How many of you in the room have heard the word innovate in your classes? How many of you in the word have heard co-adapt in your classes? Not nearly so many hands, right? So the design professions have been very much focused on innovation. And that could in fact be innovation that drags the system down. Or on the other hand, it could be innovation that actually uh, collaborates in the system 
that we rely upon. Um, and through most of history, humanity lived within that uh, area, within the limits. And as long as we operate within those limits, the system continues to regenerate fully. But as we begin to externalize impacts, we begin to move out of living within the system and the impacts get worse and worse and worse. So at a point in time, you know, back about the time that we started inventing boats and guns and knives and horses, riding horses, uh, when we got the power to take from other people and externalize the impacts of our taking that, then we began to impact uh, the system. And there's now a lot of uh, work going on right now looking at the history of agriculture and for how long agriculture has been radically changing the systems we depend upon. So at a certain point in time by externalizing, basically uh, the people who were making decisions so as to maximize the benefits that they kept and to externalize the impacts to everyone else, those are the new villains. And those are the villains that are kind of ruling the world today. And so we're hearing all of these comments about social injustice and environmental injustice and all of those kind of things. Those are the voices from which the new heroes will emerge. Um, so now an interesting thing is that in the US, looking at the green line as being the bio capacity, the capacity to support a life, and the red line being the ecological footprint, the impact we have on those systems, that we're kind of celebrating today in a very negative sense. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary <coughs> of when the United States went from having less of an impact than was regen regenerated to now having more of an impact. And so 50 years ago, we consciously co-designed the United States not as a regenerating system, but as a degenerating system. It allows us, we're taking out more on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're doing so by reducing the innate capacity of the system. So new heroes are emerging. These two diagrams are from a book that uh, John Lyle did. Must have been maybe in the early 80s or somewhere around there. I don't remember exactly when. Uh, he had them in the reverse order because he talked about the looped regenerative environment and how we had transformed re closed loop production systems into linear three throughput systems that take resources, produce one thing, and dispose of everything else as waste. Of course, in ecological systems, waste doesn't exist. It's a human concept created out of laziness. In waste, all byproducts are food for something else, and that complex system is smart enough to figure out how everything becomes food rather than everything becoming, or more and more things becoming waste. So if we reverse those two models, we can say that the heroes will figure out how to reprovision the planet, society, communities, individual lives, how to reprovision those so that instead of continuing to accelerate the conversion of resources into waste, that we actually become regenerative uh, agents in what's now called circular economies, economies that continue to produce more and more and keep going round and round without producing waste. Now this crucial time in history, I've been showing this slide with modifications probably for 30 years. And 50 years ago, the lower red line was a 1.0 footprint. The ecological footprint was in the US was the same as the regeneration rate. 
When I started using this slide, it was about 1.2. Uh, two or three years ago, I was using it, it was 1.6. Now it's 1.7199, and if you say U.S. impact in terms of number of worlds, it'll pull up this running meter out to about eight digits, and you'll watch that last digit swinging around, and the next one clicking, and the next one clicking. So in the time since I got here, it moved from 1.7198 to 1.7199. So our footprint is growing at a pace that we can actually now track and see. Of course, we've exceeded the point where we should have settled into a steady state sustainable strategy, and the fact that we're eliminating or reducing or decaying or degrading the resource base that we have to work with means that when we do find a steady state, it's going to be perhaps a lower steady state than it would have been if we'd have made those same decisions 20 years ago. <coughs> now, part of this uh, view of the heroes, if you look at living within local limits is what humanity did most of its history. You look at living outside of limits, that's what we've been doing for hundreds, or for several millennia at least. We've been doing it at a growing intensity. And then you look at this third, which is this new meta story, and some people are beginning to talk about that of humanity becoming intelligent agents in complex systems, complex adaptive systems, or intelligent agents in circular economies. So the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation funds projects that are all about how does, how, how does it advance the ability of humanity to become an intelligent agent in circular economies. The World Economic Forum does the same thing, but they tend to use it in uh, complex systems. Uh, now when I say intelligent agents, uh, how many of you, uh, IT, intelligent technologies, uh, Intelligence, we tend to think about it, is an, an, uh, a technological kind of a thing. Intelligence is broader than that, far broader. In fact, the most intelligent thing around has been the human mind. Because not only do we deal with logic and rational kind of things like computers find it easy to deal with, but our mind connects things across totally different uh, dimensions so that love somehow interconnects with the uh, number of dollars that we earn, interconnects with uh, family relationships, interconnects with how does the world see me. So we deal with unbelievable complexity and we make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Now the question is humanity getting smart enough that we make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis but we do it somehow through a dialogue with the system that we are unknowingly co-designing. And we have co-designed you know, the U.S. that we have today. We've co-designed it with ecological systems that want to behave a certain way and with human systems where we think we're defining it to behave a different way and what we get is this messy thing uh, that is the... Uh, complex system that we're dealing with today. Now, everything I do and say I frame in, the, in terms of systems. And in systems, I talk, and systems people think in three levels. Managing systems as objects. So if I design a building, I'm designing a building as an object or thinking of managing systems at the systems level. So if I'm designing a building, I'm actually designing a building's relationship within a system and looking at how that affects the system. And then the third level, which is what this unique time in history is all about, is looking at systems at what's called that metal level. So I'm looking at designing a building such that the system is working better, plus that it's also more resilient but not resilient in the reality today, but it's resilient in the system that is being co-designed for the future. So 
It's thinking of a transformational. It's looking beyond the present system and it's looking at opportunities to create new systems. Now realize that these opportunities are going to be taken in the next decade. And if many of these have not happened by 2030, which is when you're just beginning to be entering your prime, uh, then the whole world is in, uh, in bad business. Okay. Two or three years ago, I started using these diagrams. The one on the left is, and these diagrams all talk about services. How many of you have heard of environmental services? Okay. Most people tend to talk about those as if they're good. The environment's providing service. I tend to talk about them as those are being parasitic. Because we're looking at what service does the environment give to economics? But we don't look at what service does economics give to the environment. And so we've been really good about a one-way flow, about mining away resources, using the services of the environment. We haven't been good about building an economy that regenerates the ecology or that regenerates the social. And so in sustainability, there's been this notion of the triple bottom line are decisions environmentally responsible? Are they socially just? Are they economically viable? That's kind of what that diagram says. And if they're not servicing each other, those three dimensions of the triple bottom line, then it's really not being very uh, sustainable. Um, the one on the right is a similar diagram, but a lot of people are now starting to talk about the potential of any place in the world. It tends to be determined by what's called the energy, water, and food nexus. That those are key resources we have to work with. And if we use too much water to cool the power plants or the fossil fuel power plants, we have less water available to grow plants. Therefore, we can't produce as much food for people to eat. So in the same way you have the triple bottom line, you also have the energy, water, food, or the nexus uh, services. And the degree to which we're balancing those services then we are, in fact, enhancing system performance. These two diagrams say the same thing. The one on your left talks about development as nested bubbles. And so when I'm doing a development or any part of a development, uh, the nested bubble says human potential is set by the ecological system. We can't produce clean air, we can't produce clean water without consuming more than we produce. The way we have that basic resource is by keeping the ecological system happy. So then nested within a happy ecological system are sustainable infrastructure, green infrastructure. Infrastructure that actually collaborates with ecological systems to make the ecological system more healthy. And then nested within that, are built environments that interconnect with that infrastructure that, that uh, make uh, the in infrastructure function and that regenerates the resource flow. So each of these looks at, in the one case, are, each of them looks at regenerative natural systems connecting engineering and natural systems into closed loop regenerative systems and then at the next level connecting ecological systems, infrastructural systems, and buildings as systems into this regenerative network, which is what in architecture, landscape architecture, and planning you will be doing. You will be helping communities uh, plan and design their communities so that they collaborate in healthy, productive environments. Heroes will help people learn how to live within planetary limits. This diagram you have by Johan Rockström <coughs> is, I think he's leading the Great Transition Movement, or he does a lot of work in the Great Transition Movement. But it looks at the key planetary systems and where, how we're operating in relation of those to those. And you'll see that where systems in the red are we're in deep trouble. 
So the things like uh, the integrity of the biosphere or the biogeochemical flows, we're in extremely bad territory, which doesn't sound very good if you're concerned about you know, surviving into the future. <clears throat> so then this lady named Kate, Ray Kate Rayworth combined on the outside that is uh, regenerative planetary systems. And on the inside, she looked at human needs. And she created what she called the donut model. And of course, there's a TED talk on the donut model by Kate. Uh, the donut model of living in safe and just space. So as long as humanity is living within this donut, it's neither exceeding regenerative capacity or it's not failing to address everyone's need. So one of the courses that I'm teaching in this uh, sustainability minor is environment, socially and environmental justice. You know, when you're living in the donut, you're living within an, an environmentally and socially just world. So taking that earlier diagram I had of the uh, how complex systems work, putting it into the donut, <coughs> that's the challenge of design. How do we innovate and co-adapt such that our decisions and the world they produce are living within the donut, the safe and just space for humanity, and to what degree they're not. Now I'm seeing this as kind of the fifth step in what I refer to as generations of design. So when I did my PhD in South Africa in the early 90s, I was talking about a fourth generation design which was emerging. Third generation is what was happening with community-based projects, the community input, all of this kind of stuff. The fourth generation was a further progression in terms of not only community involvement, but the designer giving over control into what now has become called co-design, which I now don't call co-design, I call anthropocentric co-design. It's people working with other people to co-design how they think the world should work. But the world's too complex for that. And so what we're talking about here and what you're gonna be dealing with in the near future is learning how to design or how to co-design with complex systems. So those of you, if any of you uh, were involved in first year, last year you did a vision making New York City project, which is kind of the beginning of an attempt to work with an online interactive database to where you as a designer can go in and design something and the complex system will tell you, you're screwing up the water this way, you're screwing up uh, people this way, you're screwing up incomes this way, and so you get all of this feedback in 30 seconds, and you can generate another scheme in 15 minutes, so in you know, a couple of hours you can go through four or five design iterations that are not being designed by you as the person designer, they're being designed by the collaborative, by the conversation between you and the complex systems that are talking back to you. That's complexity-centric co-design, which is where when we get to the point that we can do that, then we will be completing that third cycle, that third transformation. We will be growing a consciously complex world which will really raise the potential productivity capacity. Now, I believe that there's not a university in the country that's better positioned to deal with these kind of things than Ball State University. It's what Ball State, what drew me to Ball State in 1996, where I was talking with people at that time who were leading these kind of conversations and they said, you want to go, there's, you want to go to Ball State. I, I asked them, uh, talking to Plenty Fisk, uh, the Center for, uh, Center for Maximum Potential Building Systems in Texas, 
where was that I told them that they were the Ball State was looking for a chair of landscape architecture and I was thinking seriously and he said jump on that like flies on you know what because uh, they they get it they get what we're talking about more than anyone else so Ball State was leading the conversation then and it's continued to lead the conversation since then so there's a 50-year uh, experience of Ball State <coughs> dealing with complex systems. If you go to their website, uh, Bob uh, has a, uh, uh, a uh, chart there that shows three generations of, of uh, the um, uh, sustainability, uh, education for sustainability leadership at Ball State. The first generation was when uh, Ball State was the first university that decided to come on board to deal with sustainability, created Cirrus, and Bob Kester is uh, director of Cirrus and Cirrus Fellowships, which have been funding faculty, myself included, when I was here on uh, specific projects geared toward building sustainability, created the first Green Committee where 14 people uh, took on uh, Dave and, and Bob and others took on uh, looking at uh, how uh, uh, Ball State could become more green. Started, had the first greening of the campus conference and the second greening of the campus conference uh, in that uh, period of time and uh, created the cluster of interdepartmental minors which have come and been then replaced by the sustainability minor and are now leading to the uh, graduate uh, certificate in, uh, in sustainability. And the creation back then in 2000, Dave Ferguson, the creation of the uh, Land Design Institute and the LDI Land Lab, he stepped down as chair <coughs> from the department and uh, went around the country looking at other land labs and how they worked and how our land lab might work better. The second generation included that kind of LDI networking with other labs, uh, the Council of the Environment coat, where the president picks, uh, designates or identifies people from the university, from the community, from all aspects of the university, administration, staff, faculty, and uh, from the community, the leaders in the community, and they sit around a table and they deal with sustainability on the local community level. Second generation also dealing with the Telwa <coughs> declaration. Then the third generation, which is kind of where you are now that's dealing with things like the president's climate commitment, sustainability strategies, uh, the GRI uh, reporting that's being done, et cetera. So we're in this third generation uh, and one of the things that's come out of this, uh, I've had conversations with Bob who has really built over the period that he's been doing this, a deep appreciation for the difficulty to keep this vision moving forward because universities are very ephemeral kind of things. You're here, you'll be gone in four or five years, and a whole new batch of people will come in and in essence be starting over. Faculty come and go, administrators come and go. It's really hard for the vision. It takes a real sophistication to be able to build the network that it takes to keep the vision alive. Also the notion of having your champion, you know, for the first 20 years of the program, I guess, Warren Vanderhill was the provost of the university, provost in charge of everything education. So Ball State was the leader nationally in greening of the conference, in the greening of the campuses, in sustainability education. We weren't necessarily doing it physically, but we were doing it with the educational program because our champion was uh, his control, his area was, uh, was education. So out of all of that, several structures grew. Uh, Sears and the various places where Sears has worked in Indiana, in the US, the Council of the Environment I've already talked about, 
the Academy for Sustainability, and each of these entities were created by the university to bridge disciplinary boundaries, to get outside of silos, to be able to take, get access opportunities like STEM funding, et cetera, <coughs> and how to bring the whole community into an effort regardless of where that effort might be housed. <coughs> New academic uh, initiatives, looking very quickly at these. Community-based projects like Brownfields to Brightfields, Global Report Initiative, GRI Reporting, uh, BSU now managing the Muncie schools, as well as building all of these other key connections in the community and the state. So you're networked to have the deep conversations that it takes local level, state level, to do things like transforming brownfields into bright fields or uh, sharing, having conversations with businesses around the world in terms of how we deal with sustainability and how they deal with sustainability. And then things like the Food Hub where Ball State helped funding for the creation of uh, the Food Hub and now are integrally involved in the management of that. Most recent initiative just being launched now, as Bob said, is the Graduate Certificate in Sustainability um, that uh, uh, is basically 12 hours of credit for people who have uh, completed their undergraduate uh, degrees generally. Uh, and then also looking at the broader other kinds of initiatives. The Center for Regenerative Studies at Cal Poly Pomona, I visited actually, spent some time there uh, back in 1996. Uh, all they had there was this laboratory and they had um, the, uh, uh, a cognate they added to degrees. And from that they've grown all these different things like undergraduate and master's degrees in sustainability, et cetera. So how we use this graduate certificate in sustainability as a launch pad to build these other things. I'm going to close with 10 slides. Each one's dealing with a trend that I either see happening or that I'm having discussions with people about happening or that really need to be the uh, next trend to, uh, to emerge. The first one is universities realizing and appreciating the need to become more synergistic more able to take different kinds of things and bringing them together into holes that mean more than the pieces that went into them. So you can't deal with the messiness of real world problems unless you're able to deal with the complexity at least as robust as the complexity that creates those problems. So one is realizing that universities have to expand their areas of concern. They have to get outside of their disciplinary silos. They have to embrace whole system thinking. Uh, they have to engage in integrative learning. They have to build the ability to make synergistic decisions. So not only knowing how to make a building that works, but knowing how to make buildings that actually help uh, other things work better as well. The second is the need to address the legacy of sustainability or unsustainability. In this workshop we did in 2016, we walked away with the major conclusion was that more than anything else, Muncie needed some way to transform the image that the outside world had of the quality of life of living in Muncie. Uh, and so, those kinds of issues, and it's because of the abandoned factories, the brownfields, and these kind of things. So all of the things that we do with community-based projects to transform those problems into regenerative solutions is dealing with this legacy of unsustainability. Um, the third thing we need is, or that they're realizing the need for, is the uh, on-campus regenerative learning center. And in fact, at Ball State, uh, in the second generation, 
we had this uh, proposal for the LDI Land Design Institute Land Lab. And we actually proposed it as a system for taking a Ball State field site, Cooper Skinner site, and putting in place this learning forward structure where people would make design decisions, they would plant areas of planting, they would build building prototypes, they would engage in a system in a way they thought was sustainable, and the system would feed back to them as to whether how sustainable that decision really was so that they could then learn forward to make more sustainable decisions. So it was before the technology that was there to do the things like vision making New York City that we were doing uh, in my sustainable land systems class uh, that I'll probably be teaching in the spring that you did in the first year. Those now have the technology there to where you have virtual complexity to really give you instantaneous feedback as opposed to having to set up a research project and monitor it over two or three years, five years or whatever. So um, the notion of having a center on campus for learning forward how to design sustainably is, uh, is crucial. The fourth is the difficulty of the higher education institution challenge, which is what I touched base with before. You know, it's really hard for universities to change, not only because of the uh, ephemeral nature of things changing, and people changing, et cetera, but also because of things like accreditation. You're bound by accreditation not to stray too far from what the profession does now, when in fact the kind of things that I'm talking about are the other side of the mirror. And so they become in some ways a threat to accreditation as you begin to allocate more and more things to dealing with how we should be co-designing the world to work rather than uh, just operating within, within the way it works today. Third is the need to help communities transform into regenerative networks. So this has to do with students building the skills, not only that they understand regenerative networks, but they know how to engage with communities to build the exciting stories, to build the commitment, to cause the, uh, the people in communities to realize the criticality of living sustainably within the system they're a part of. Um, so that whole notion of being able to inspire with powerful stories is crucial and of course Ball State's digital storytelling and its history in building powerful stories is very important to these kind of things as well. Trend is healing complex socio-ecological environments. Now the interesting thing to happen is if I look at where that is happening the most in universities, it's in agriculture because the way we produce food is killing the pollinators of food, or it's killing the pollinators of plants. The way we grow food by poisoning the soil, only allowing the monoculture that's been bred to, to deal with the poisons, poisoning the soil is not a good way to be growing food. So agriculture is really hurting, and because of that, there's a lot of uh, innovation going on in restorative agriculture, in regenerative agriculture. And the interesting thing is that regenerative agriculture is grounded in understanding ecological interconnectivity. Regenerative architecture is grounded in understanding ecological interconnectivity. So much of what's happening in regenerative agriculture, there will be corollaries in regenerative architecture. So the knowledge base is beginning to be, to be built. <coughs> Help communities learn to provision or reprovision if they've already previously provisioned in the wrong way, and how to provision and design regenerative communities. You know, so having your water department in a city not talk to your energy department means that the energy department isn't going to be dealing with water very well. And so how to get communities to have the crosstalk, to have the synergistic ability to build solutions that optimize everything 
rather than maximizing how one entity, the department you're working in, uh, may work. Uh, the next, the eighth trend is making universities and programs highly accessible, and you all know the term uh, ivory tower. Uh, the Graduate Certificate in Sustainability, uh, we're really excited about, Ball State's excited about, because it is a highly accessible program. One hour courses, five week chunks of time, so the person can take one course over a five week period of time, test the waters, and not having had to make a big time commitment. And they can bite off a little piece, and if that chews pretty well the next semester or the next five week session, they can bite off a couple of pieces. Uh, and so uh, being able to have something that fits the lives of the people in the community is crucial, and I think that program does it very well. The next to the last trend, uh, trend <coughs> is to deeply embed universities in their local communities. And I know um, Scott Truex, uh, a couple of years ago when, when I retired from Ball State, was doing a lot in terms of what universities are doing what in having facilities downtown, having their campuses downtown, or whatever. Um, one of the things, one of the terms that I like particularly, the last three lines there, living life together. That's what culture's all about, it's what communities are all about, and how can Ball State reposition itself in the community that it's seen as living the life of Muncie together with the community, and I think that's the kind of uh, connectivity that will make the, uh, in, which will enable the university to actually lead the community with uh, active, committed people in the community moving to sustainability. Finally, the last trend is the need to unlock complexity and embrace complexity-centric co-design. I'll leave that one for the last because that's totally me. I'm the only one that I know, oh, I'm the only one that I know a year or two ago that was doing, using those terminologies. Now when I do unlocking complexity in the internet, I begin to see other people using that terminology. So I see it as kind of the most advanced as well as the complexity-centric co-design but I think that's the trend, that's the big meta trend that we're looking, that we're operating within. And so when we can unlock complexity and we can allow the wisdom of ecological communities, the wisdom of indigenous communities, the wisdom of people who have engaged in ecological systems throughout history that haven't destroyed those, when we can figure out how to bring all of those into the conversation with as much appreciation of those lenses of how the world works as we give to the science lens, then I think we really will be uh, making fantastic inroads. The last comment I'll mention in closing is one of the organizations that I've enjoyed doing stuff, just uh, taking some of their coursework and stuff, it's called the Pachamama Alliance. And there it's indigenous people from the Amazon <coughs> that saw their way of life being destroyed and that decided they're not gonna run from danger, they're gonna greet it. And so they went out to the science community and now it's this collaboration of indigenous of people and uh, the scientific community that's operating as an alliance all over the world and so they're Lots of Mama Alliance groups in the U.S., they're in Brazil. I'm right now working with a uh, conference, an Amazonian uh, rainforest forum that we're looking at for, to occur next year and looking at how to get the indigenous cultures of the Amazon playing even, even a greater role in that conference because in many ways they're the experts. They're the ones that have lived sustainably for thousands of years in the Amazon, and we haven't been able to do that. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed the, the presentation. Any, uh, 
Any, any questions? I know I ran a little bit long. I apologize for that. Any questions? I think it's, uh, it's being recorded, so I think there will be uh, an opportunity to, to see it in the future. All right. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Bob.